I can honestly tell you, nobody has any idea to live one month in mining, to turn around and trace the public disgrace for my family, to trace how that, that I believe preventable deaths from my family that suffered because of all the pressures and stress and everything. That is all the responsibility of there's no consequences. So you've been tormented every day for 31 years. I am tormented as we speak that I'm not able to convince anybody that the RCMP and the Winnipeg example have somehow or other escaped consequences. The media seem to have this so close marriage between prosecutors and police and RCMP who meet weekly to set plans they for their agenda. They work together on a daily basis. They work together on a daily basis. And I'm asking, if nothing else, uh, please get on side and give us a hand. We are rolling and recording. My name is Bob Wilson and I'm here to show um, as best I can and explain as best I can that we were informed that if we could come up with one uh, bad conduct, uh, uh, non-disclosure or criminal activity by any of the actors in Operation Enterprise or the jailing of MLA Bob Wilson, then that we would be entitled to a new trial. Mr. Scullion, Justice Minister Nicholson, Vic Taves, and all the Winnipeg media have refused to look up. And I'm saying to you, what is wrong by everybody that's in elected office becoming ombudsman to look in the dark corners of government? What is wrong with Operation Enterprise that's been sealed by Ottawa under an order for, uh, order for return by any MP could be brought forward to the public? What was Operation Enterprise? What's its connection to the Jets and the NHL? What is connection to the Michael Gabotti finances and the entire Gabotti group? What connection is it to the NHL board of meetings May the 7th, 8th and 9th, which were attended by Jack McDonald and which when he arrived in Winnipeg at May the 10th, rather than going to the victory party for the Jets at Ray and Jerry's, he came over to my house to pick up a $6,000 check. And my life has been ruined ever since because of the dishonesty of those that we hold in a position of trust that we want, we want and should demand that we have an honest prosecution staff, that we have an honest police department who are trained that there's going to be consequences when you destroy people's lives. The prosecutor's duty is to be fair and honest and that unfortunate ladies and gentlemen, the uh, federal justice team under David Freyer and Bruce McFarland uh, unfortunately uh, placed a very strange tunnel vision uh, culture of win obsession before they placed some kind of rule of law and equity in the legal system. The very bottom, he says, the trip to the Maritimes is proof that I'm a master criminal and a dope dealer. Then he puts August 1979, a trip to British Columbia. Well, when I phoned home from the Commonwealth Conference, my housekeeper said, Anne and Judge Malloy and Victoria want to get hold of you. So I phoned them and they asked me as a favor, could I come and pick up my daughter, Jerry Jen Wilson, who's a personal childhood school friend and she's staying there for two weeks. But all of a sudden the judge has new people arriving and wants me to come and pick up Jerry Jen early. So I said, Judge Malloy, I'll make the best I can to get there as soon as possible. There's a third charge that I was acquitted of that Bruce McFarlane manufactured and put together based on the fact that I took a trip to Victoria, BC allegedly to go into the drug business by with a car salesman named Charles Eaton Thorpe and what all the connection to Charles Thorpe was that when we got there I phoned him at his Mercedes dealership in which he was making money and he wasn't certainly in the drug business and he loaned me a little car to drive out to the nice home that Ann and Judge Malloy lived in. 
Judge Malloy sat me down and his wife brought cookies and tea and we spent hours sharing a common interest of politics and I, I couldn't believe it. I thought the guy would be high-handed and uh, very elitist and he was a very down-to-earth judge. But here it is that Bruce McFarland stoops to a MLA visiting a judge to throw this man in jail for seven years for conspiracy to traffic in marijuana. We're talking about six policemen here in the Bob Wilson case in Operation Enterprises that committed perjury the same as in British Columbia. That's a very, very expensive waste of taxpayers' money. This Operation Enterprise was well over $2.3 million in the budget screw-up. And that's why Bruce McFarlane had to find a high-profile fall guy to take the rap for this absolute terrible horror story. And, and all I'm saying that uh, everywhere along the line, people seem to get promoted. Like Judy Webster, who prepared that 121 list of, of law enforcement officers. She became Chief Justice of Manitoba. Well, I'd just like to tell all my friends of British Columbia that the Dzanski uh, taking these RCMP to trial, perhaps uh, long before this took place in British Columbia, uh, we in Winnipeg missed the boat because uh, in the Bob Wilson case, Operation Enterprise, we lacked the uh, political will to stand up to the uh, RCMP bad conduct and behavior. So I would like to go back to uh, uh, one of them in particular that I feel that if he, uh, if we could have Ottawa uh, have him deal with uh, his involvement that perhaps we could speed up my new trial and to be free at last and to bring some pride and honor to my family. And his name is Jills Gurton. Now, Constable Jills Gurton was uh, Bruce McFarland's favorite and he was uh, his co-conspirator in crime. But Jills Gurton started off the day they raided my house at 6.30 in the morning, September 26, after spending three hours and finding no drugs, no money, a family, a father, a child, a, two, uh, a housekeeper and her friend, and a man repairing a bar on the third floor, they came to me with polygraph forms, Barry Story and the rest of the constables that were there, because they could see that there had been a big, big mistake. So lo and behold, I signed all the forms and everything, and out of the blue, after about a 15-minute wait, because I thought for sure I was going to be free at last, appeared on the scene was a Constable Jills Gurton. He says, we can't give you the polygraph because the Chief of Police, Herb Stevens, and the Inspector, George Pike, have called a press conference to announce that you had been arrested. So we could have saved all this trouble, according to Jills Gurton, if the City of Winnipeg hadn't jumped the gun. Then Mr. Gurton reappears on the scene as naturally because he goes down and wants to help Bruce McFarlane up. So he goes in the court under sworn testimony, committing perjury, and he tells the jury and everybody that the arrest tape was destroyed, that after two minutes it was, couldn't be, there was nothing on it. Well, lo and behold, he was then asked by Mr. McFarlane to read his alleged notes that he took. So he says, when arrested in his bed, Mr. Wilson said, who's been telling you stories now? But the truth of the recorded tape was, what's this all about? So because McFarlane had wanted, because a conspiracy is more than one, he wanted Girton to make it plural. But to go along and say that the tape was destroyed, when I was in prison, the Second in command, uh, Deputy Bob Mullock came out to the prison, said, Mr. Wilson, we're pleased to announce that the arrest tape was not destroyed and it's available to you. And then when I asked for access to information, I got the correspondence between Bob Mullock, Inspector Bob Mullock, and the head commissioner, the head CEO of D Division, ATF, Sandy McAfee, and in that is an admission 
that Girton committed perjury and they're worried what's going to happen. It's a very it's a very indication from the top down the RCMP were worried that somehow or other the misdeeds and misinformation in my case would be made public. But Mr. Girton isn't finished there. Bruce McFarland needs help. He wants a slam dunk. So, Mr. Mr. McFarlane asked his friend, a, 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 Mr. Doug Rutherford in off, Ottawa, he says, we need a preferred direct indictment. I've got an attempted murder case here with uh, MLA Bob Wilson, and but he didn't send along the supporting affidavit. Well, I can't believe it, but guess what happened? Doug Rutherford was able to convince the Justice Minister of the day, Jacques Flynn, to sign a preferred direct indictment to make Bob Wilson only the second person in Manitoba's history to be denied a preliminary hearing, a hearing and to have a preferred direct indictment. So lo and behold, I get a break. The Justice Minister puts the date on beside his signature. So there I've got the 16th of January 1980 and I've got this affidavit. There is no affidavit. The Justice Minister had signed the preferred direct indictment without the supporting evidence that a serious crime had been committed. So McFarland, to his surprise, gets this blank, they get this blank preferred direct indictment. So what does he do? He's freaking out. He gets Judy Webster to get busy and work overtime and to, 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 to come up with a sophisticated, unbelievably sophisticated attempted murder supporting affidavit. She can't find a crooked Winnipeg policeman. She thought Gislason would sign it. But lo and behold, McFarland says, try Girton. Here's this fr new French-Canadian arrival from Quebec with a language problem. He's signing this sophisticated scripted affidavit prepared by Judy Webster and he signs it. And so they're able to take that to the court and on the 25th of January they get a preferred direct indictment charging MLA Bob Wilson with attempted murder and gets it signed. That means I get no preliminary hearing and Jay Prober proceeds to be the darling of the media and tell them that Mr. Wilson's charged with attempted murder and that he goes on to say there is no escape, that you can't defend a preferred direct indictment. In other words, I believe that this is when Jay Prober, who has had a gambling addiction, I believe that's when he gave up on me because he knew that with a preferred direct indictment uh, in front of a jury trial, not a judge, that with the psychological profile that Robert uh, McMeekin did for Bruce McFarlane to obtain all older men, all women were denied access to being on my jury. They wanted older men that had children that who would hate drugs. They even got their choice of a uh, judge who had drug addiction problems in his family and hated anybody in the drug business, Ben Huack. So you have a liberal judge and you have McFarlane and his gang and so the results are, are very, they're unbelievable. So that's Jills Girton signing this affidavit and Bruce McFarlane used him when he wanted to tidy things up like when Operation Enterprise was closed by Ottawa he had Jills Girton stay charges against all 11 co-accused all facing seven years each that were involved in my case and that's there those are all court documents if there's any law faculty member or criminology person listening student Please look at this. We're open, we're there, we want help, and we would welcome any support. May the 5th, 1979, they hooked up my home, 775-6955, to be wiretapped. Now, apparently this was part of Operation Enterprise, which was a 2.3 year, very massive and expensive case in which they were following around uh, the Michael Gabotti group, they were checking on his finances on the racetrack and sports teams. And Ian Jackson McDonald, an ex-Winnipegger, 
who was raising money for Mr. Gabotti to be able to apply sometime in May for an NHL franchise. This one here is Robert James Sims. I got Mr. Sims was a bad cop because here he says the day before Mr. McFarland, he's this aggressive young prosecutor, he calls an RCMP guy to the stand in a red uniform and he's supposed to be an expert on um, how um, people in the drug business, uh, they all use pay phones. So the following day, this aggressive detective, Robert James Sims, takes the stand and says that he was on his way home for dinner. And he passed the corner of Napin and Maryland, and he saw MLA Bob Wilson using a payphone outside his business office. And prior to that, the police and that had taken the say, and Mr. Wilson had five telephones inside his business office. So Mr. Sims, trying to help McFarland, says that he saw me using a payphone, so he circled the block, and he made a note of the time, 6.05, and he said he was on his way home for supper, and he saw Mr. Wilson using a payphone. Well, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, my home phone was wiretapped, and at 6.05 on September 26th, I was at home with my grieving family, and on tape 114 and on tape 113, on both of those cases it shows that Bob Wilson was receiving calls from the media and friends at home at number two Middlegate. And so the evidence of Mr. Sims was tainted enough, but the boldness of his claim and how, how he had misinformation was that he lived in Lockport, Manitoba, St. Andrews, Manitoba, that's due north. If he's going home for supper, why is he going down south on Maryland, over the Maryland Street Bridge? So these are the kind of things that, through years of research, I've been able to come up with. They presented the, the all-male jury with two sets of the notebook. One was the original, with the discoloration because of the uh, chemicals for fingerprint and stuff. And then they made right, right out a copy. The only problem was, in his enthusiasm, Harry Barrington had this habit of writing X's and O's sign in front of every number. William Gordon Wright never wrote that. The digits. The he never wrote the digit in front of numbers. And so you have all these things with a lot of good friends and that'll help down over the years, which show that this planted notebook is impossible. And there's, there's the key to this thing. At the corner it says September 26th. And there's two criminal acts by policemen here. Um, Harry Barrington and Constable Bakefield Moore initialed this thing. They had this notebook on September 26th, and they then tried to pull it off that the Revenue Canada found it on the 28th, and they claimed it was found at my business office where it was found at RCMP headquarters. So we've, for the public and for the Ottawa, CCRG people, we have listed 32 reasons. The judge's order here is uh, very clear, and he's begging, the judge is begging, Judge Ben Huack gave us a judge's order that all 1168 tapes and transcripts were to be given to Bob Wilson, and through Bob Wilson would have been the general public. To this day, the general public who thinks uh, you know, the reputation of the police is, is uh, good or unbelievably naive in that here's an example of the judge's order being disobeyed. And, and here you have the judge's pathonotary, Alan Rouse, begging David Freyer, the director of the federal justice team, please obey the law. And so the only thing they ever gave me was tape 114 and tape 22. Now, tape 114 is the one that I needed to prove that Constable Sims was lying, and tape 22 was also there to show that, that uh, why were they after Bob Wilson when Operation Enterprise was about 1,168 tapes of other elite people in the city on one of the wiretaps that Mr. McFarland didn't play.
That was the tragedy of my case and my trial, is that they cherry-picked. You know, there was only two hours of problems at May the 10th at Middlegate. They could have presented all those tapes. But they had Jack Tinsley, who was a constable, altering the, the times, 841 to 918. Nobody ever showed the jury that this was a three-story home. Never, nobody showed the jury that what cars were parked in the driveway. And even, they even lied about saying that I was driving a Lincoln when I was driving an old station wagon. Even when I went out to the farm with Yvonne in the car and I stopped the car three miles to go to the bathroom because I had to go and the RCMP guys following me say, Mr. Wilson went into the bush and left a parcel. Very, very real. These guys that they couldn't stop where I stopped and pick up the parcel because there was none. All of them are just giving their bosses and their superiors what they want. All the evidence in the United States was denied this trial. We had a letter, Mike, uh, Mike Ward went down there. My mother paid $800 for Mike Ward, a reporter with the Free Press, to go down and pick up the marriage certificate. We'd been tipped off that McFarland was going to play all the wire, intimate uh, husband and wife uh, wiretaps of Jack McDonald and his wife. We got the marriage certificate, we presented to it, McFarland went ahead anyway. And he's got his wife talking about sex and everything else. So, this is the kind of tricks. And, and there was a letter from Mike Ward to myself in which he had interviewed the police chief, Tony Panada, and the, and the police chief of, of the uh, city of Florida had said, Bob Wilson's not involved in our investigation in any way, shape, or form. He's just a tourist. So you have all the United States evidence is denied and under non-disclosure, Mr. Scullion and his staff should immediately give me um, a new trial or at least give Mr. Mahanan here the go-ahead to look at all the United States evidence because the fugitive Ian Jackson McDonald is now in the remand center in Winnipeg, Canada and his trial should be coming up and that will be interesting. Bruce McFarland wanted a fall guy for Operation Enterprise and he chose my family and my career and I've been 31 years in pleading with people to have a look. Why has Canada got no process like Britain where they have the CCRG that frees over 200 people? Canada has only freed 13 in its entire existence. What kind of justice system have we got?